another episode of 90 Minutes of Wisdom, a channel dedicated to helping you expand your knowledge and develop a more successful and peaceful mind. My guest today is an Isogenics Legacy member and has been in the wellness industry for over 25 years. He is a char chartered herbalist, medical exercise specialist, strength and nutrition coach for the U.S. Women's Rugby League. He's also a nationally ranked natural bodybuilder. His current focus is on mental health and mindset through the I Am Project. Welcome to the show, David Jilks. Welcome, <laughs> David. All right. Thank you very much, man. Good morning. Good morning. So nice to see you, man. It looks bright and sunny. Wonderful there. <laughs> <laughs> where are you right actually right now where, where I'm, are you? On, I'm on Vancouver Island in British Columbia so yeah. yeah so yeah well it's bright and sunny only because uh well you know I make sure I have good lighting inside my office <laughs> <laughs> nice nice and you have so many wonderful books behind you uh it, it's a big reader yeah yeah it's uh well I think there's a Brian Tracy thing that I heard uh uh, two decades ago that Brian Tracy said that if you read a book a week, which I don't, but but I read every day, but he said that basically if you read every day, within 10 years, you'd be the highest paid and the most uh, knowledgeable person in your industry. And I'm neither, but I'm way further ahead <laughs> of where I was before. And it's, um, yeah, and yeah, books are, it's incredible, right? It's just because there's a, there's a whole list of stories and ideas and things that I don't have the time or the bandwidth to even figure out. And so they're, they've been really instrumental on that, kind of on my journey forward, for sure. Yeah. For, you know what I've been really interested in? I just haven't pulled the trigger is uh, Mentor Box. Have you, right. have you heard of that? That looks really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's one thing that I shy away from. I, I listen to lots of podcasts, um, you know, um, in driving, but uh but there's something about actually having a book in your hand and turning pages and I get my pen out and I dog ear the pages and I, I scribble in the margins or something that I, I can interact with the book uh, physically. And to me, that's really important. Uh, podcasts are great, but, uh, but I like that. I like that physical connection to a piece of material. Yeah. Yeah. But the whole point, I guess, of mentor box is that the, it's like Cole's notes is like an abridged version. Yeah. So they just take right. Like, so you can run, I mean, you know, theoretically you can run through, all the most important or 80 percent of the knowledge in 15 minutes instead of right. like going through the whole thing but i don't know i've seen, read so many mixed reviews it's just like what you said yeah. you know is it does it really how was your retention rate is it really i don't know it's good well it well the, the thing is i think what's missing is that um, um what's missing is the lead up to the point all right so if i'm just getting the point it's like watching a movie and and you know the movie has the soundtrack takes you through the dramatic you know where the person's standing on the cliff and and all the uh, the enemies coming behind, and you miss the lead up to it. It's just, I think we need to be emotionally connected. We need to be on the journey rather than just getting, uh, you know, would you rather have, would you rather just be dropped off in front of the Eiffel Tower than picked up 10 minutes later and taken to Athens, Greece? Or do you want to hop on the train and take the tube to the next place and be a part of the environment and the lead up to the tower and the lead up to the piece? And it's, there's a whole journey that's missing. And, and I understand the idea. And I, because people's, um, uh, let's say people's uh, chosen attention frame or attention span is limited. And I say chosen specifically because we choose to be that distracted. We choose, you know, and, you know, we blame it on social media. We blame it on all these pieces, but, but we choose, you know, we choose that. And, and I think, mm. I, I, I don't think, especially, I think if somebody's on their journey forward, I don't think things like that are really good. I think it's really important that you lay the groundwork when maybe you've got decades of, of reading and, and you know, tremendous comprehension behind you, then those pieces will, you know, those pieces will drop in and they'll connect to a pre-existing framework of knowledge. But if you don't have it, I think you still need to do the work. You need the book in your hand. I, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, right. I agree, man. No, there's no shortcuts, right? No, there's really no. no shortcuts in life. <laughs> no. whenever, you, whenever you find one, you end up realizing in the long term that it wasn't a shortcut at all. It was actually <laughs> much longer to get yeah. to the same place yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with that yeah. for sure you know what i like to do I, and i find i must admit I, I have books i have some of my favorite books around me uh my book <laughs> and um i have you know uh napoleon hill laws right. of uh law of success which is the original think and grow rich right uh 1925 right. version before it was altered 
So like these, and I have a bunch of other books here that I'm always reading, but I find, you know, myself uh, with YouTube, what I like to do is do YouTube and I do two times speed and I read, I put the closed caption so I can read uh, okay. and absorb at the same time. So an hour video, I, I, you know, I, I take in at 30 minutes, but by having the closed caption and reading and listening and viewing and being just fully focused and mindful of it, I can, uh, I can really absorb a lot of oh, information. What a great idea. Yeah. And retain yeah. it. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's my trick. Um, yeah, man. So let's say there's so much I want to speak to you about, and you're so in, you're such an interesting and accomplished person. And I, I guess the first thing that I'm, uh, I wanted to ask you about is is the I Am Project. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's uh, well. I mean, you know, I've been in the fitness industry for um, you know since my 30s, and I'm 55, so I've been at it a while. And and. I guess, you know, the one thing that I started looking at uh, as I had spent more and more time in the industry, I, like anybody else, the first time you get into any line of work, you're super excited. You had this uh, insane idea that, you know, wow, I'm going to change the world. Everybody's going to listen. They're going to just do exactly what I said and everybody's going to be amazing. And I'll be, I'll be held up as this, you know, some credible uh, leader and, and transformational artist. And then I realized that people won't, don't listen. And, um, and the failure rate in the fitness industry is over 85%. And the weight loss industry, it's almost, it's almost 100%. Almost nobody ever stays the course. And, and after, you know, and of course, um, you know, I kind of go, well, it, it's either their fault or my fault. So let's just assume uh, in the beginning, that's my fault. Maybe I'm not a good enough trainer. Maybe I don't have enough information. So you take more courses and you take, you know, more certifications and you try harder and you, and you extend, overextend yourself. And then, there's something that I heard from a, a, a trainer named Phil Kaplan, who was a, a really an amazing trainer in the U.S. And he said, the fitness industry is the only industry where you can actually pay for a service that's advertised, fail to get the results, and then blame yourself. Mm -hmm. I go, yeah. Oh, yeah, right? So yeah. Well, that, that was really interesting. And I, and I loved what he said because it made me more accountable. So I, I, I didn't blame the client, and uh, though I get frustrated with them and myself. But after a while, I just go, man, it's just, it's not working. Like it just, it's, um, yeah, we get some success and maybe my standards are too high or maybe the standards are too low. Like there's all this process of trying to figure out what's that, what's that mid ground. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of things and a few things parallel. There's a few things going on inside my head that had nothing to do with each other that I thought. So one was Tony Robbins was in one side of my head uh, from, now this is going back a long time. Um, it was uh, Get the Edge. Get the Edge audio CDs, right? So Fantastic. Would, Absolutely. Yeah. You have to go through. It's like a required reading. Like all the Tony yeah. Robbins, you know, giant within. All this required reading, I think. Yeah. yeah. So Tony Robbins was one side of my head. And, and get the power, you know, and I, I, had, I had a couple of his books. And, um, and it wasn't him. Like Tony Robbins, I have a love-hate relationship with him. I love some of his stuff. And, you know, but then I don't like him. And, but, but the framework of what he does is brilliant. You know, you know, if I pull him out of the picture and say the framework of what he does was extraordinary. But I was interested in not him or what he was doing. I was interested in where he got it from because mm -hmm. he made reference to neurolinguistic programming. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's where he started. He started with NLP. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So John Grinder, Richard Bandler. So, so I was interested in wh where he started from, not him himself. So I, I was kind of digging into NLP. And this was, again, a couple decades ago. And NLP, when they... And it was talking about these uh, uh, these submodalities, right? These things going on inside your brain, right? We we process information, you know, uh, through our senses: visual, auditory, kinesthetic, gustatory, olfactory. And so that was formulating on one side of my brain again, not not knowing what it, where it was going to go and what it meant. Um, and then trauma, you know, and what what emotional trauma, and he was able to collapse phobias in seconds, you know, where therapists couldn't do it in years, and he was doing some pretty amazing stuff. So again, I still didn't know what it meant. Like I was taking, I was taking training. I spent thousands of dollars on courses, um, and but it it still wasn't. It was still sitting all by itself in one part of my head, and it wasn't really be, as effective as I could be. And it, nothing, uh, everything kind of fell into place when I started uh, getting involved orthopedic rehab. So I started um, there's a, uh, some training I started doing probably 17 years well, longer, I guess now. Uh, I've been on the planet way too long, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, 
when I, and the, or this orthopedic rehab program designed for, for strength trainers like myself, and it was really de- it was helping trainers understand the mechanism of injury, what was going on with the nervous system when the body was traumatized, and then what doctors were doing, what surgery did, and then the rehab process. So, you know, I was filling in the blanks of, okay, how do you, how do you help broken people? And what, was, what stood out for me inside that conversation was that everything was almost neurological. I have an ACL tear, right? So I, I injured my knee and the surgery was done, but the nervous system was still affected. There was a guarded thing inside the brain. There's a nervous system is still affected, not just the tissue to the knee. I dislocate my shoulder. Well, the shoulder dislocation comes to something called an apprehension sign, which means fear, right? I'm apprehensive. So if I rotate, you know, I rotate somebody's arm back very slowly, there'll be a certain angle where the, the amygdala of the brain will light up and it'll shoot this fear message to the body and the person will quickly draw their arm in for fear of it dislocating. So I go, well, that's really interesting. So the physical injuries are only part tissue, only part physical, but they're really neurological. They're really, it's in the nervous system. And then the understanding that actually muscles are only chunks of meat. They don't do anything. They're, they're, driven, almost, they're driven almost exclusively by the nervous system and controlled by the nervous system and then powered by our metabolism. But by themselves, you're just a flank steak. Right? Yeah, that's interesting to say. And just to interrupt you, you know that experiment where they take someone's arm and then they put a fake arm and they hit it with a hammer and then the person freaks out, right? Like the body, <laughs> like they can feel the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so cool. It's so crazy. So yes, I completely understand what you're getting at. Yeah, so, and again, so I, I got, well, it's really interesting. So everything about me physically, if I want to change if I have a damage to my knee, the damage is also to the patterns of my brain that operated the knee. So I have to actually go into the brain to change the map, you know, because I have an injured map in my brain of the, you know, it's like scarring, taking the CD out of a, well, we don't have any more, I don't think, but taking the CD out of the tray and scratching it with a nail, it just doesn't play the same, even though it's the same CD. And so the memory of my knee injury has an injury uh, part of the memory and now, fear and apprehension and you know lack of desire to put weight on that joint it's all there and so well that's really interesting and then my brain kind of slam two ideas together saying i wonder if the same way i deal with somebody's injured knee is the same way i deal with somebody's injured past Mm -hmm. yeah huh can we is it the same circuitry is it the same process and do we is it necessary to go through all the convoluted sifting and sorting of history and conversation do we have to go? Do we have to go make it that messy, or maybe we can actually get through this process faster? And, and it's not because we don't want to have to do the work, and it's not because, let's say, the uh, the necessity for conversation, the therapeutic setting, it's not not necessary. But does it have to take as long? And is there a way that we can more powerfully get somebody grounded? Yeah, that's it. I get it. What you're saying is like more about. Uh, precision and accuracy right instead yes. of going this wide blanket because we don't know where it is you're kind of narrowing in on, on the issue and able to find uh, that precisely i completely understand yeah yeah so neuro-linguistic programming you know it kind of provided a interesting tool that was more yeah just as you said it's more laser like more precise um you know because again your entire history of your entire of your life and every experience is housed in your memory And so, you know, and we don't realize that, you know, even as you're listening to me now, we're not, you're not listening in real time. There's a stagger. There's a bit of a delay between what I said, what you heard and what you think I said, right? It's like one one hundredth of a second, but it happens so fast that you hear all these sounds, you see my, me wildly gesticulating in front of you and all the stuff's going on. Your brain's going, okay, what's he saying? What does it mean? Have I heard it before? Does it make sense to me? You know, and then you, you know, then you, you respond with your, with, with a comment. Like it's all a st- like reality comes at us in, in delay because we're making it up as we go along. And that's a really, it's a bit of a disconcerting thing to think about because it puts a tremendous amount of responsibility back on our shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I get it completely. I know there's certain things that um, with memory that when, first of all, it's, it's some crazy statistic, like 60% of what we think we remember is wrong. Like when we're, yeah, yeah. you know, all these things we say, and even just happened the other day, was talking about some experience in high school and I was like oh yeah the, it's, this girl wanted this uh the teacher was asking for a tape and my friend was like no it was a camera and I was like mm, okay <laughs> I, I, I had it wrong right I had it yeah. wrong in my brain and I was like you know but I was I'm totally accepting of that now I don't fight it so I'm like yeah I probably was wrong it's just stored 
So the brain, if it can't make, if it forgets something, it, it photoshops or fills it in yeah. right, with something <laughs> to make sense, but you have no idea anymore oh. what's been photoshopped right into your reality the other thing is with your movie there's that experiment where you move your finger there's we have this huge blind spot right? right like somewhere right around there and if you move your finger but when we look around we don't ever see that blind spot it's because yeah. it, again it's photoshopping it's taking picture frame one and it's like here and it's like oh god i'll fill in that in between it's so cool it's crazy the way the mind works yeah yeah well and and again, the more you get into it, like it, there was a point when I started getting into this stuff where it made me, I got a bit nauseous around the whole idea going, you know, because my, my connection to reality was becoming very loosely, uh, uh, it was being kind of tethered, you know, the tether was being kind of sawed away. And it didn't feel very good to know that, well, I mean, it's not, things are not as real as we think they are. I mean, they're as real as we uh, comprehend them to be, but so much we have under our control there's so much responsibility the burden of responsibility can be so huge and it was a little bit overwhelming like i didn't actually i didn't feel good for a while when i was going through this stuff it just didn't yeah it just because of my rat my perceptual reality was being kind of unhinged and that's not a good not a good feeling when yeah you know you know when it just, you don't know if what you think is true but but what but on the other hand what was really exciting was the idea that um that we could actually uh, uh, we could take what we we could cut the journey that no, we normally take as let's say a lifetime, and we reduce it by decades. We could uh, we could we could take uh, challenges that people are having, and within, uh, for example, like last year we uh, had a retreat in Mexico where we had 15 people come down for uh, for an ion project immersion, and stuff that people were you know they struggled with for years, like years of life. We you know we would sit somebody in a chair, we call it the hot seat. And we'd take them through a series of exercises and we would actually physically extract a memory and they didn't have to talk about it, right? So uh, it's a part of the deal with the process is that you don't actually say what you're thinking because quite often, and I remember my own experiences of being in a therapeutic setting, you know, you go in and they, you know, they walk you through the process and, and they're asking and they're, they're kind of directing you. They're trying not to be directive, but they still are, that they, they have to draw it at you somehow. And what I found is that I'm only giving the information that's comfortable and safe for me to give, but it's not really the truth. It's not really what I want to talk about, but I, how many people actually have the courage to actually speak the insanity that goes through their head sometimes. And I go, no, you're not getting any of that. So I'm going well, I paid my $200 for the hour. Um, and, and unless, you know, and there's some really skilled therapists out there, but like in most things, right, there's more unskilled than skilled. And I'm going. This is insane. The truth is still left sitting in my mind, and I yes. and I can't I can't get it out. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, there's different views, and there's some amazing um, psychiatrists and psychologists, but a lot of it I I, I don't believe um, is very helpful to keep replaying traumatic experiences. Tell me about that. Tell me about that. Now you're just creating neural pathways. You're reinforcing yeah. neural pathways, and you're not solving it. You're just like keep going over these things. It's just. Uh, it doesn't, I get it. It's the tools they have. I think it's antiquated. I think it's the wrong yeah. way to go. And I am a firmly um, a believer in everything that you're talking about, about NLP, about, uh, you know, more precise ways to, to look at, uh, to look at it and solve yeah. it. Well, 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 here's the interesting thing. And, you know, and this was, this was actually the most profound thing where, again, I was looking at the world of the physical and the world, the world of the, the, let's say the psychological and, and, the brain loves patterns and I was looking for an answer and I was active saying, you know, what is, what is the commonality between those two things? And it was actually really quite simple, lack of core strength. I'm going, okay, so what does that mean? Well, so I did my own little experiment with clients. So clients didn't realize when they came to see me, it was just a big Petri dish. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was doing my, my experiments with them inside my, my facility. But what I looked at is that, okay, we have a, we have a, we have a traumatized map of movement caused by shoulder, knee, hip, back, or, you know, whatever. So part of our physiology has been injured. We have a memory of the injury that has pain attached to it, that has apprehension attached to it, um, avoidance attached to it. Don't want to put weight on it. Don't want to move it, right? So it's very, and it was traumatized. So big, big uh, emotional peak experience of a damaged knee, the damaged shoulder. Um, so the so the whole movement map is injured. So so well, what if we'd actually if we know the map is injured, maybe we need to make a new map, a reality. So let's actually not touch the shoulder. We, so we wouldn't touch the injury. So, well, let's look at, there's a bunch of other things going on. What is happening as well as the knee or the shoulder or the back? 
Well, let's look at your posture. Let's look at your congruency, right? And these words are interplayed very, very well back and forth. Let's look at your core strength. And so we, we'd assess that. Well, poor, poor overall uh, mechanical congruency. So the energy doesn't flow very well. You don't move very well. You're not very uh, um, graceful in how you move. Your core strength is not what it should be. So let's spend a couple of weeks or even a couple of months really developing great physical posture, great core strength. And that's going to be the, you know, almost 80% of our behavior. But, but here was the important thing. It wasn't a matter of just doing the exercises because I needed to know that you knew that you could actually make the muscles react in, in a very specific, very particular sequence. So I'd have, I'd have a 3D imaging. So it put, put some software on the screen saying, this is what your core looks like. Okay, so they'd see it, you know, strip away all the muscles or all the tissue. And at the very base of the spine, here's a series of muscles here and here's your pelvic floor. This is your core. So this is where it is. And they'd, they'd, look, they'd uh, acknowledge it. They'd build a visual map. Okay, now what you think about, it, I want you to see that in your mind. I, so again, part of the NLP technique, right? Visual, the visual modality. Now I want you to think about feeling it. So I want you to feel it. So kinesthetic, I want you to actually try, practice contracting it. So you only think, I want you to feel, then I want you to do the movement but only in that sequence. Never do the movement without first thinking the sequence, right? So, and we know that neurologically, it takes about six to 10,000 repetitions to, to create a brand new map, right? A brand new map of movement. So, but it wasn't just any old repetition. It was the same thought process, the same feeling, the same procedure. Like it had to be very precise, right? Uh, um, uh, Napoleon Hill was really good at that because I actually, I'm going through Think and Grow Rich again. And precision, very specific, right? Very, you know, that's why he says, you know, read this stuff out specifically, feel this specifically. It can't, it can't be, it can't be random because, well, then it's because it's random. Then the, yeah, the result will be random. But I like that when you talked about your training. And one of the things that comes to mind is um, somebody very wise when I was young told me, master one thing, and then you can make like uh, analogies or understand other things so for myself it's music so I look at everything through music but you're an expert in health so I understand it's really cool to see how you're able to say from health and physical things because I'm saying you're um it's all mental I mean yeah. picking up something or doing a certain thing is all mental and it's all uh, good habits good yeah. routines good procedures that are put into place so I think that makes a like it makes a lot of sense and uh, seeing how you use that um say you know like basically mastery of, of physical to, to to go to and and address the mental i think that's very very interesting and then the last, the last point i wanted to make was just yeah. martial martial arts i did a lot of martial arts when i was younger right. uh, tai chi kung fu karate uh taekwondo and then you learn well i said look if you can do the stretch if you can stretch that much then you should be able to kick that high <laughs> you know right. it's just yeah. so what's the difference it's just it's, it's in here it's not out yeah. there it's in it's all in here so very yeah cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think once we, you know, once that understanding become greater and saying, well, yeah, I'm not doing anything here. It's, it all has to start above the neck. And when you get in this process, so, but here was a really interesting thing. Now with the injuries that they, these individuals would have, there, again, I said there was an emotional uh, avoidance to putting weight on the, on the knee or on the back of the shoulder. So we would, um, so, so we'll get back to this this, we'll get back to that body part in a bit, but let's just work on your core strength. So let's say after a period of a couple of weeks, and these exercises, they would do twice a day, every day, twice a day, every day. So if they're going to do it three times a week, don't bother. Because there's so much raw sensory information coming at you. It, you know, I always look at the mind like a sand dune, and there's just so much stuff pushing it around, and it's always changing, reforming. And so if you're not actually being, being very rep repetitious and precise in what you're doing, it doesn't stick. It just it doesn't do anything. And and all and all the research in um, the neuroscience, when you look at, um, there was something called the Monday effect, and it was um, these uh, individuals that were uh, blind learning how to read Braille, and they'd uh, they do a, a, a PET scan at the beginning of the week, and uh, look at the uh, brain and, and the brains uh, and the maps that were um, uh, parts of the brain that were given up to. Uh, um, to sensory control, sensory feedback from the fingers, because you got to read Braille. So there's a sense, but there's also a motor piece to it, because you got to, you know, you're moving the fingers across the Braille. So it's sensory and it's motor. And look at the, then map the brain and say, okay, how much of the brain is really given up to this behavior? Then these students would, would read the Braille eight hours a day. And then, uh, then they have homework. 
And then on, the, on the Friday, they'll go back and remap the brain and see, well, yeah, all sorts of different areas are lighting up the brains, becoming the maps more expansive. But Saturday and Sunday, they were to do nothing. Go back and remap the brain on Monday. Almost all of the information in the brain was gone. It just all disappeared. It didn't stick. And it took almost, I think almost eight months, almost eight months before that map, what was there on Friday, was still there on Monday. And, and that's the part that people don't get. And that's why, you know, that's why the schizophrenia that we have in the world with information and it's all over the map and we're not picking a lane. If there's no, if there's no continuity of it, and if you don't, can't stay in that one spot and have the discipline to repeat the thing over and over and over again, it just doesn't stick. And that's why, that's why people get so frustrated. But mm -hmm. yeah, but that was, but, yeah, that is. And that's very, very, that's, no, that's very interesting and very true. Um, and you know, I think though, like what you're saying before, with the like with the training and those kind of things. Uh, whenever you say well, two things, points I wanted to make, I'm, I'm jumbling them in one into one. Is um, when you whenever you say emotion, I always think of chemistry, like from yeah. Dr. Joe Dispenza, right? Yeah. So when there's like um, an emotion tied to it, it's like a chemical release uh, that that happens in, in your brain. So that's something. And then we do get, like you said, it compounds these traumatic things. So you. Yeah. You feel something hot and you burn yourself you know when you're a kid and then yeah. okay and then but then see certain things so it really becomes uh quite interesting when you start unwinding that yarn and say like why do i do the things i do yeah. and you know what there's there's um this book called influence and it was talking about having these little things so like the fact that you have like books behind you yeah. it, it causes a certain already certain uh, people will react to you differently. And right. they were talking about if you had a religious symbol, even if you're not Christian, and there was like a cross in the room, right. that people had a tendency to lie like 30% less <laughs> just because there was a cross there, right? And yeah. they did all these tests. And then if there's, um, and if you're in a business environment, so if you have like a briefcase and it's kind of serious and you have a diploma and someone comes in and you try to negotiate with them, they're going to be really like hard on their stance. So like, you're know, going to say, well, listen, I'll give you, you know, uh, David, I'll give you 40%. You'll be like, you know what? No, I want, I want 45% or it's a no go. Right. And right. we'll kind of like go and back and forth. But if I had like beanie bag chairs <laughs> and like a fish tank, <laughs> and it was just like all chill. And I said, Hey Dave, what do you think about 40%? You'd probably be like, yeah, it sounds fair. You know, <laughs> it's, just, you know like, it's just these things, these little things, right. That, uh, anyways, amazing, amazing stuff that, that yeah. we really don't, um, think about uh, why we do the things we do. Yeah, well, and and really, I mean, it is quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, the fact that you know all these things are going on, and I, it, I think, I, I think the number is there's 600 million bits of raw data per second that our nervous system has to figure out what to do with. Like it's just so much, so much reality, but we only actually we filter in all of it except for about 2,000 bits per second. So all that other reality is going away, and it's our filters. You know, our, our, it's our, the way our mind's filtered just through life experiences. And most of it's unconscious. And we filter it, all this reality and all these possibilities just get, can they get dropped to the floor? And we, we think this is all we got. Yes. That, but, I'm a huge believer in that. Like Dan Locke has uh, an amazing video on that, uh, on the filters. And depending, like you said, like 2000 bits. And that's what the yeah. yes, conscious mind can process compared to the subconscious mind, which is, can, is, absorbing everything and processing it yeah. behind the scenes, right? Yeah. So we don't know anymore <laughs> what's being put in there because we can only perceive that little amount. Yeah. And, then, and then it's so important to have that positive attitude, affirmations, yeah. those kind of things, believing that today is gonna be a great day. Now you're looking for those bits of information, those 2000 bits yeah. to support that idea. So you're getting those things, you're missing those other things, which is, just amazing and so if yeah. you get up in the morning and say this is going to be a terrific day compared to the world's terrible and this is probably going to be just an awful day that's like you know and then you could go through the same events and have either an amazing day or an awful day right. depending on the filters that you have which is really awesome yeah. well, well what's what's interesting you know when you um you know when you look at the physical component and and i'll just finish that thought process of walking somebody through these uh you know uh, weeks of training of these up to 10,000 repetitions. And then we, then we had them go to work on the injured area. And so, okay, uh, first of all, before we actually touch this shoulder, knee, or hip, let's spend a few minutes, let's turn on all your core muscles, right? Think, feel, and do, think, feel, and do. Now you know what they, you know where they are, you know what they look like, you know they, how they feel. And you have this really well-illustrated map in your brain, this really, really well-illustrated idea uh, in this motor map. 
now when those are all turned on, now I want you to move the shoulder. And so we'll take the shoulder, we'll move it and move it. And, and they're waiting for something, but it never shows up. They're waiting for the fear, it never shows up. And they're going, that's amazing. Now, is the is shoulder 100% better? No. But what we did with it, though, is what we, because if you don't get rid of the apprehension, you can never train the shoulder because you're always in fear. So we, we created a brand new thought, right, which had core strength, core strength, and then shoulder, core strength, then the knee, core strength, then the lower back or the hip or whatever. And so fundamentally, over time, when we started training people is that every exercise is a core exercise. You cannot say that I'm going to do my core after my workout or before my workout. You're, if, if you think that if you think that you're gonna do if you think that's the way it works, then you're uh, um, you're physically schizophrenic. All there's no congruency in all these parts. It's like martial arts, right? Martial arts is, uh, uh, was a great example. Is that you know you look at a martial arts or a dancer or a gymnast and say, well, how do they move like that? Well, there's no left or right. There's no up or down. There's no back or forth. There's simply mechanical center of gravity, which is your pelvis. And I always like in our extremities, arms and legs are like the canes of a blind man sampling the world around us and draw, driving information back to the spinal column, back to our core for interpretation. And then the, spinal, then the nervous system sends the information and tells these four extremities how to interact to best get us, how it help us man, manipulate our way to the world, whether it's athletically or whatever the case may be. So everything ideally should be for a fully integrated physical human being, a core exercise. You shouldn't, be any, you shouldn't think of it any other way. And but that took me a long time to come to that conclusion. But when, it, when I got it, when I it just kind of went pow, and my strength went through the ceiling. I automatically became more flexible, and I remained relatively injury-free. I've been training a long time, so 30-year history of training. And uh, being a competitive bodybuilder, you know, you're moving some weight, right? You're moving some tonnage. And I don't have the joint issues that, that my, a lot of my compatriots would have. I don't have – I'm not going in for a knee replacement because I blew it out because I just I crushed it while doing squats and I didn't destroy my back doing deadlifts because the, my whole body, my integrated self, my core stable self was doing the movement. So all of me was involved in a bicep curl. All of me was involved in a deadlift, not parts of me. And so th th there was really quite a profound space and, and I couldn't believe I was seeing it. There was, um, and we'll leap onto the psychological part is that, um, I have this heightened sense of awareness of my body. I'm very kinesthetically aware. And my brain, for some reason, was looking for a pattern. It was looking for the pattern because one part of my brain, I grew up in a, a, um, a fairly challenging environment, but it was also very religious. Um, so there was this piece in the corner of my brain formulating away saying, there's also another pattern here that you need to look at because there's a similarity between the physical as there was the emotional, psychological. And my brain was trying to find a way to make these patterns mesh, right? Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, for sure. And I think that that's also um, can be, if not understood correctly, I and mean, you do understand it correctly, but if I'm misunderstood, humans are always looking in pa for patterns because, and we'll always find patterns in everything. In the most random thing, humans will find a pattern in, yeah. right? You'll say, oh yeah, that's, that's a pattern because that goes way back to our monkey brain and the reason we see green more than any other color and all that stuff. It's, it's our, our society's advanced so much and our basic um, neurology, our brain structure, and you're saying amygdala and different things are, are still way, way back, right? Still the fight or flight. Am I going to get eaten by a lion? Where's the source of water so I can, you know, have fresh water and what's, right. is, there, is this a poisonous berry? And so we're always looking at these patterns to serve us, right? And to understand it correctly and looking at it like scientifically where you look at something and say, you're trying to disprove it, right? You say, when you have a theory, you, you start off by saying, well, you know, what's the null? What's the, how do I disprove it? Looking at right. it from that way. And right. then you got to look at it because if you look for just like, evidence to support what you think you'll, you'll find it you know? <laughs> yeah especially at google right yeah yeah oh my god yeah don't get me started with that that's uh <laughs> oh my god yeah whatever you type in you could type in the like flat earth there is this flat and then everything you'll see is going to be supporting that right like yeah, yeah, yeah and then you'll never ever see anything saying the world the world is round anymore it's yeah. it's flat and that's it and every youtube video will be flat earth <laughs> did you know like oh yeah it's it's scary that's scary yeah, yeah well it's um